Start recording. Yes, we are recording now. All right. Let me show the screen here. All right, Jamie, is my screen share coming through? It is. Perfect. Perfect. Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, it's 12 o'clock, and uh, we are on a, a tight timeline today, so we're eager to get started. And I uh, just want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Daniel Prohaska. I'm the president and CEO of Lions Vision Services. Um, we're a statewide nonprofit that provides um, vision related health services to low income families uh, in all 46 counties in South Carolina. Um, we're really excited for you to join us in the first of what um, we intend to be um, a series of quarterly events, um, virtual events that will allow us to um, dive deeper into our mission and our work. Um, the first of these is focused on looking at vision health in South Carolina uh, with um, an expert panel uh, that can provide information and expertise from the field uh, to supplement and guide our um, discussion and our analysis, uh, and specifically what this means for our communities and what we can do to better address vision health moving forward. Um, just a few logistics to get us started here. Um, we ask that um, you should be um, arriving to the, the Zoom call on mute and just ask that you stay on mute during the presentation. Uh, if we have time at the end for a general uh, Q&A, we will um, invite you to unmute yourself at that time if you have a question you would like to share with us. Um, but in the meantime, please make sure that your name stays visible so that we can see you uh, and um, be a part of the, the conversation um, through the, the chat feature. We invite you uh, to submit any questions that you have during our program through the chat box. We've got um, some support monitoring that and keeping an eye on it for us. Um, and if you would like, you um, can also feel free to include your name, uh, your organization, if you represent one, um, and your location in that chat box as well. So we can get an idea of who all is with us this morning and um, where you all um, are from. Uh, we couldn't start this program without extending a special thanks to um, our partners that are making this possible. Uh, we appreciate the um, physicians that we have through the Clemson Eye, uh, Columbia Eye Clinic, and the Storm Eye Institute at the Medical University of South Carolina. Um, we uh, rely on partners like these to do our work and to expand and uh, educate the public uh, on vision health. And we are incredibly grateful for um, their participation today. Uh, we also would like to thank the um, Francis P. Bunnell Foundation for providing the technical support that is allowing us to um, provide this event to you today. Um, thank you to the Bunnell Foundation for helping us and for um, encouraging these types of virtual um, collaborations while we um, continue to be mindful of the coronavirus um, pandemic and what we all are facing there. Uh, so with that, uh, I want to uh, jump right into our program. Uh, we've also got uh, our vice president, our executive vice president at Lions Vision Services, um, Wynn Fitzgerald on the call, who uh, will be co-leading a presentation uh, with me on some statistics related to vision health in South Carolina from some of the data sources that we used uh, in the community to guide and inform our work and um, to help to provide some structure to the dialogue that we're gonna have with our panelists today. So we'll start with that overview, um, but we're going to move through that presentation rather quickly so that we really get to spend the um, lion's share, if you will, of the, the program today, uh, talking with and engaging with our expert panel. Uh, these are individuals that um, as you get to meet them will um, bring just an incredible depth and breadth of personal knowledge and firsthand experience um, to bring this data to life and to help us understand its relevance uh, in our communities. So we're very excited about that. And uh, we intend to wrap up that conversation with enough time for um, a few general questions and answers towards the end of our program. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn things over to uh, our Executive Vice President, Wynn Fitzgerald, to begin our um, discussion on vision health in South Carolina and where it stands today. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you everybody for joining us today. 
Um, in reviewing the prevalence of vision impairment in South Carolina, you're gonna see here that nearly 150,000 individuals are reporting living with some form of vision impairment. Severe is, uh, vision impairment is gonna be higher for those that are reporting poor health and less than a high school edu education. And also one half of seniors 65 and older um, with severe vision impairment have reported a fall within the past year. If you break down the rates of vision difficulty by demographic in South Carolina, you will see that women rate higher compared to men and ages 35 to 64 rate higher than other age categories. It will be interesting to come back to this during the panel discussion, um, if time permits to discuss the rationale to support these findings. Moving forward without effective intervention, by 2050, the CDC projects that diabetic retinopathy will increase 72%, cataracts will increase 87%, Glaucoma and age-related macular degeneration will increase by 100% and vision impairment and blindness will increase by 150%. The work that we do here at LVS, as well as similar organizations like the Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired is key to implementing intervention and preventative services to help provide a solution to these issues. Thank you for that, Wynn. And um, we do want to also take this opportunity to uh, demonstrate for you the reason that we feel vision health is so integral to really talking about the um, quality and sustainability of our communities. Um, there is uh, a connection between vision health and um, other health conditions, not necessarily a causation as we'll be able to dive into with um, our panel, but those with severe vision impairment, um, the CDC reports are more likely to have diabetes, arthritis and mobility issues, specifically if they live in South Carolina. Um, this data is um, for our state in particular, um, which means that the individuals that we are serving and, and addressing through vision health are going to have other health factors that uh, should be taken into consideration to really create a holistic picture of um, how we can use vision health to put people on the path to um, full recovery to their, um, to their community. We know that vision loss is also related to depression and isolation. Uh, that's a particular um, heightened concern for us right now with the coronavirus pandemic where we all uh, are a bit more um, socially isolated than um, we have been. Uh, we also know that vision loss is related to stroke, hearing loss, uh, chronic kidney disease, balance problems, falls and fall related injuries, um, and risk of early death. Um, in this way, uh, it is a um, barometer for the likelihood that an individual will have other health issues. Uh, you can see here from research from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that dives into county specific data um, across the state. Uh, the dark areas here really closely mirror some of the, the dark counties that um, Wynn mentioned earlier as having a high prevalence of um, vision loss or um, blindness. So again, we see the um, parallels here between um, vision and the general quality of life and um, the general um, health and sustainability of the communities that we're addressing across the state. Um, it's important for us to keep this geographic perspective um, in our work, particularly as a nonprofit, to make sure that we are targeting our resources where there's both the greatest need and um, the greatest opportunity for impact. While you're more likely to be familiar with issues of chronic diseases like diabetes, cancer, and heart disease, eye disorders actually rank fifth in highest medical cost, um, yet get little attention. By finding solutions and preventative measures to combat vision impairment, we can reduce the economic burden in South Carolina by two to $3 million and allocate funding to other sectors. While the government entities and insurance shoulder some of the call, um, portion of these costs, the patient is footing the majority of the bill for vision related services. For a client of LVS whose annual average income is $14,500 with a family size of three, vision health is not 
um, attainable for them sometimes. And resources from nonprofits like LVS are often their only means of obtaining these much needed services. Thank you for that overview, Wynn. And, um, and just to clarify, the, um, it's a two to three um, billion with a B, um, not million uh, with, with an M, uh, economic impact that we um, are looking at here with Vision Health uh, in South Carolina. So um, really profound uh, economic burden that uh, we can help to better address in our state um, through effective interventions. Uh, so with that, uh, that provides a little bit of uh, local context for us as we um, get ready to get into our um, panel discussion. Um, once, we, uh, once I finish introducing our panelists, uh, I'll bring my um, screen sharing down so we can all get a chance to see each other a little more clearly and um, dive into this conversation. Uh, but we're really excited for um, such a distinguished group of ophthalmologists uh, to be with us um, this morning. Uh, Dr. Joshua Nunn uh, is a, a specialist in um, ophthalmic and cataract surgery and comprehensive ophthalmology at the Columbia Eye Clinic. Uh, his clinical interests include um, presbyopia and uh, astigmatism correcting cataract surgery, uh, as well as laser assisted cataract surgery, medical and laser management of glaucoma, medical management of diabetic eye disease, and medical management of macular degeneration. Um, Dr. Nunn completed his residency at Penn State Hershey Medical Center and Lebanon Veterans Affairs Medical Center in Hershey, Pennsylvania. He earned um, an MD at the University of Virginia School of Medicine in Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, and uh, completed his, internal, uh, or his internship at Pinnacle Health Internal Medicine in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, he's a member of the American Academy of Ophthalmology and um, an American uh, Medical Association member. Um, he's also a former board member for Lions Vision Services, and we're excited that he is um, part of our conversation today. Uh, Dr. Joseph Parisi uh, is um, an individual who was born in Akron, Ohio, and raised in uh, Ontario, Canada. He entered uh, the Life Sciences undergraduate program at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario and subsequently obtained his medical degree. Uh, his internship was at the Royal Victoria Hospital in Montreal, Quebec, part of the renowned McGill University medical system. Um, following this, Dr. Parisi returned to Queen's University for a residency in ophthalmology, which included a year of neuro and ocular pathology. Uh, after this, Dr. Parisi, or Parisi has built a successful career with respected um, comprehensive ophthalmology practices in Hamilton uh, in Ontario, Canada, and was on staff at McMaster University Medical Center and Hamilton General Hospital uh, for four years. Uh, he um, subsequently moved to um, the South Carolina area and is uh, a partner today at um, Clemson Eye, where um, he is a co-executive director there. He lives with his family in Greenville and enjoys a variety of outdoor activities, including um, running, cycling, curling, and skiing, as well as um, guitar, cooking, and travel. Um, so we're really excited for um, the broader, uh, more continental-wide perspective that, that Dr. Parisi can bring to this uh, conversation. Um, and Finally, but certainly not least, uh, Dr. Millicent Petersheim is professor at the Storm Eye Institute at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston. She's the Bruce Pratt Endowed Chair for International Ophthalmology. Uh, Dr. Petersheim's major clinical interests include um, pediatric ophthalmology and adult strabismus and internal uh, ophthalmology. Um, her pediatric perspective is gonna be an exciting part of this conversation. Uh, she, uh, prior to joining uh, MUSC in 1999, she was assistant professor of ophthalmology at the Hershey Medical Center in Hershey, Pennsylvania, and was in private practice at Park Ophthalmology in the Research Triangle Park of North Carolina. Uh, she has given numerous lectures and presentations nationally and published uh, numerous peer-reviewed journals and made contributions to several textbooks. In addition to a number of professional memberships. Um, she's actively involved in community outreach efforts 
to further increase awareness and support for proper vision screenings um, for all children and has some exciting um, international um, experience with those partnerships um, that we look forward to um, tapping into through our conversation. Um, so thank you uh, tremendously to our panel for being here today. I'm gonna bring this screen down so that we can all um, see each other here and uh, invite our panelists to um, unmute their uh, microphones so that we can dive into um, some conversations about the data that we've heard, um, the impact that this has on our communities and what we might be able to do uh, moving forward. So I've got a few questions to guide our conversation. Um, I'll present those questions and then um, sort of tap one of our panelists for um, a, a lead response and invite just a group conversation amongst our panelists uh, to carry the conversation forward. Um, so with that, let's start with um, the, the map that we saw of vision uh, impairment distributed across our state on a county by county basis. Um, that map really seems to mirror um, what has been referred to in the past as um, the, the corridor of shame or some of the more rural um, historically underserved communities um, along the I-95 corridor. Um, how does that distribution affect our response to addressing vision health needs in the state? Um, Dr. Nunn, would you like to start us uh, with this discussion? Sure. Um, so unfortunately, I think it makes a whole lot of sense that <clears throat> the areas of poor vision health are in the same areas of poor general health and um, difficulty getting access to positions, both because those folks have decreased screening as well as poor overall health definitely contributes to poor eye health. Um, I think a big challenge for us is gonna be either getting patients to areas where they can be seen more easily, sort of a take the mountain to Muhammad method or getting more screening resources out to them. That will probably be the easiest thing to do. Excellent, that's a very good point. Um, Dr. Petersheim or Dr. Parisi, would you like to weigh in on that conversation? Go ahead. Sure, well, I'll, I'll jump in then. I'm, I feel a little outnumbered by all the Penn State people, but I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll try to make do. Um, you know, Dr. Nunn is, is absolutely correct. You, you know, we see the uh, prevalence and distribution of these health conditions reflected with eye conditions as well along socioeconomic lines um, all the time. And, and as those maps were, were pointing out, you know, identifying the, the health factors that are important uh, uh, so that we can, we can uh, um, improve general health uh, behaviors like smoking, alcohol use, drug use, um, you know, access to quality care, uh, socioeconomic factors uh, such as education, number of employment, uh, uh, social services, clean, safe living environments, all these things that impact so much uh, of the general health and well-being are, are going to lead to the same sorts of things that, that tie into vision care issues. And, and I think you know, not just in South Carolina, but everywhere, um, general medical care is, has been a, a reactive rather than a proactive problem. And, and uh, screenings are, are huge, very important. Uh, getting access to care, as Dr. Nunn said, is, is super important. Um, but allowing these people who don't have the, uh, maybe the, the uh, well, wherewithal to be able to afford care on their own, uh, some assistance so that they can do that. And of course, I'm coming from a, a system north of the border where, where that wasn't a, a problem and, and it's become very much a concern here with, with people who are underinsured or uninsured not being able to access those early types of, uh, of care that we need. And I would Dr. just, Peterson, yeah, yeah I, I would just add, I mean, from my viewpoint, the children, the children are, are really important and the key that children need good vision to learn. They need to learn to get a job. They need a job to get out of poverty. And that, that's definitely a cycle. Um, and people need good vision to take care of good, take good care of themselves and to get to the doctor and to uh, the access, the access is really a key um, uh, need to be met in these areas for sure. 
Absolutely. Um, Dr. Petersheim, you've had some experience um, in the field uh, in some international context, um, working with organizations um, specifically focused on these on screenings and, and early interventions. Have you seen any effective solutions that have helped to get this kind of early intervention out um, more effectively? Um, or I guess a, a broader question is uh, just in, in your general experience, um, what might some of those best practices be for um, getting these um, early intervention uh, services to the, the people that need them most? Well, the, the best practices for children are to, at, at minimum, make sure every child has a good vision screening by age four, um, check in visual acuity in one eye and then the other. Um, they do that really well in the Netherlands. You know, they've, they've definitely decreased amblyopia and visual impairment in their population of adults um, by having that ongoing program for, you know, a couple of decades. Um, so it is possible, it can be done. It, it just takes, you know, it takes what we, we can, we can work on that, I guess. Um, there are also some of the new um, automated screeners that are, as of 2016, recommended for pediatricians to use, uh, starting at 12 months and then 18 months at the well baby checks that identify risk factors for amblyopia. Amblyopia being um, decreased vision in one eye or both eye that, that is caused by one eye having an advantage over the other or the brain just not getting a clear image of, of what's going on in the world. So it does, they don't develop good vision. And that, that process occurs uh, first early in the preschool age, but also up to age six, seven, maybe eight. Um, so you really need to catch them in the preschool age. The earlier you catch them, the better vision they will have um, in the long term. So I think the increased use of the devices the, that, are, that are out there that are, they're still working on, but they're, they're pretty good, um, uh, will also help to catch these children earlier and decrease the risk of amblyopia, decrease their chances of, you know, not seeing well in school and therefore not doing well in school. So try to break that cycle. Absolutely. Um, I think building um, capacity for um, effective intervention with uh, vision health in uh, specifically these targeted communities where um, the need is, is so great is um, a major concern for um, the vision industry and certainly for nonprofits um, like us. Um, one of our challenges is often public education, public awareness of making people um, cognizant of the importance and the priority that vision health um, should have um, for their, their life and just in their, um, in their overview of, of how they address their personal health um, and we've talked a little bit already about how vision health appears to closely resemble um, the status of an individual's general health in South Carolina. We touched a little bit on that. Um, so would you say that um, in terms of, of building public awareness and public buy-in that um, it is reasonable to make the case um, that vision is that barometer that can help us measure the general health um, of a population. Uh, do you think that that is um, a hook that could be used to more broadly engage the public in making vision health a higher personal priority in some of those areas um, where, as we can see, it currently is not? Uh, Dr. Parisi, would you like to start this one? Sure, no, I, I completely agree. I think it is a barometer, not the only barometer, but certainly a key barometer in uh, reflecting the, the general health uh, of an individual and of a population. And, uh, you know, when we looked at, at studies of uh, 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 value-based medicine, and, and it's very common that people rank their vision, not only as their most cherished sense, but also on par or exceeding how they value other medical conditions, even, even heart disease or you know, hip replacement surgeries and, and, and other things that we would think uh, uh, rank very highly. People rank their vision extremely high. Uh, and I think we need to be cognizant of that and uh, realize that people should have access to uh, eye vision exams early as Dr. Peterson 
was mentioning because that's where it starts. And if you if you lose the battle in childhood and somebody doesn't have the resources to uh, be able to learn in school because of a vision problem, and then they don't complete school, and then they're not employable, and then the whole the whole cycle spirals out of uh, uh, out of sphere. And and uh, and then in the other populations, we have people with medical conditions. The big one, of course, is diabetes, which can, which is so common, especially in the South and and in South Carolina and other Southern states, uh, and is a huge uh, contributor to uh, vision threatening eye disease, and is preventable and is treatable, um, as well as uh, cataracts and glaucoma, which of course the two most common sight threatening conditions in the world, uh, eminently treatable and preventable. Uh, and, and if not, lead to uh, socioeconomic disaster in, the, in those people that have those conditions because they can't work, they can't function, they can't drive, they can't meaningfully interact with, uh, with people around them when the conditions get uh, very severe. So absolutely a barometer for those conditions. Absolutely. Dr. Nunn, um, did you have anything that you wanted to contribute to that? Um, I think Dr. Parisi did a great job of sewing all that up. Um, I guess the only thing I would add is it'd be a great way to galvanize people. I'm just reminding them that, you know, vision loss doesn't cause things like diabetes, but diabetes causes tons of vision loss. So one great motivator for these folks to take care of themselves is, you know, get your diabetes under control, get your hypertension under control, get your cholesterol under control, because this is going to help to save your vision. Stop smoking. That's going to help to save your vision. Um, those are, you know, the vision is something that people very, very much appreciate and very much fear to lose. So if we can use that as a motivator of, you know, you improve your general health, we'll be able to keep you seeing better. That may be a useful tool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Dr. Um, Peterson, this gets to um, a little bit of what we were discussing earlier with um, really focusing on um, prioritizing vision needs amongst children specifically in that early intervention. Um, I'd like to drill down a little bit on some of the partnerships we were talking about there and ask um, specifically for South Carolina, um, what do effective partnerships with school nurses and pediatricians look like? How can we utilize um, those individuals in the school system to help us really um, get a, a, a better handle on addressing um, pediatric vision in our state? Well, there, there's so many opportunities. <laughs> um, uh, I know um, there are lion, you know, there's several Lions clubs that I know of in the in the state who do a great job doing some vision screening, helping out the school nurses with screening. Um, uh, I, again, some of them just check vision, some of them use the photo screener um, devices. Those are great partnerships. Our school nurses are already kind of stretched thin anyway, so it, it helps out and I think it probably is a better, a better program, to be honest. Um, I, some of many reports have said that uh, less than half of the children that are actually referred from a vision screening. Um, I like to say the kids are referred from a vision screening rather than that, that they failed a vision screening because that sounds bad. But if they get referred for special attention, that's good. Um, but about half of those children um, don't ever get the care, don't ever see the eye doctor. And I don't know that that's you know, specifically for the state, but that's certainly a risk and we, we do see that. Um, so that trying to make that connection with the parent to let them, you know, not just maybe send the piece of paper home with the child, but to follow up, to try to um, educate the parent about why that's important and then get them the care that they need, which is often a challenge for these families to take off work, they're depending on that income, they have to drive, they may not have a car, helping some of those families maybe and helping the school nurses track that down and make sure those kids get, get the care they need. Um, I know of a program in uh, Naples, Florida where the Lions Club has worked to um, ensure that pediatricians have access to photo screeners and um, help again, follow up with some of the care that the kids need. Um, 
The Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired uh, did a screening in Charleston County that I worked with closely that they stopped doing a couple of years ago. <clears throat> Um, but that was a great program and we actually, actually, the doctors went to the schools and performed the exams at the schools and then an optician um, came and fitted the glasses at school. And we did a little report on that and it worked and the teachers thought it was um, really helpful to the kids that they got glasses and that was a, that's an, an you know, a, a huge undertaking, but um, can be done. So there, there are creative ways to try to um, get the children the care that they need. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Parisi um, and then Dr. Nunn afterwards, do you have any um, additional thoughts on um, what those partnerships with school nurses and pediatricians specifically uh, might look like um, to be successful? Uh not a whole lot more to add uh, uh, to Dr. Peterson. And I agree that uh, certainly pediat pediatricians uh, having some training in, in eye care during residency programs is, is key uh, in order to be able to pick up uh, not only uh, vision threatening situations, but also life threatening situations. You know, the classic example of a retinoblastoma that might be picked up in, a, in an infant uh, is, is critical. Those children may not be recognized before treatment is too late. So um, certainly uh, those sorts of uh, additional training programs within a residency program are, are, are welcome and vital. Uh, to give our pediatricians the confidence that they need to, uh, to detect these problems. Wonderful. Dr. Nunn, um, any other thoughts to add to that? Really nothing else to add. I think um, everything's been summed up well. Wonderful. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, vision loss being um, related to, though not necessarily causing uh, other medical conditions. Uh, we mentioned depression, isolation, stroke, hearing loss, chronic kidney disease, balance problems, fall-related injuries, and risk of early death. Um, does one, if, if we were to pick one other medical condition specifically um, that we could um, pair with vision health, um, which other medical condition do you believe would be um, highest priority to um, pair with vision health to help us take a more holistic approach to addressing vision and general health needs um, with South Carolinians. Um, or to put it another way, if um, organizations or entities or resources were to be allocated to addressing um, another uh, area of health, which one would have the, the strongest connection, the strongest impact um, there? Dr. Nunn, would you like to go first on this one? If I had to pick just one, I would actually go for diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, diabetes has huge ramifications to the overall health, including vision. Um, it's one of the leading causes of vision loss in South Carolina, as well as the country as a whole. And if we could get diabetes under much stricter control, we'd see a lot less vision loss. Sure. Dr. Peterson, uh, what's your perspective on that? Um, well, it's, I'm almost going to go with just glasses. Um, mm -hmm. Medicaid does one pair of glasses per child per year. Um, they're not always the best quality of glasses. If they get broken, misplaced, uh, the child waits the year. Um, unless a family can afford it, and sometimes they do, but it's a huge, it's a, it's a huge expense for them. So um, to get better glasses, some plastic you know, comfortable plastic colored frames and once it lasts and then um, have it be replaceable. And I, I also just take the opportunity to note that any child with a learning disability or any, you know, issues uh, needs to get an exam. So that's, we, we want to see those children because those often go hand in hand. Sometimes we can really help with their learning by um, giving them the right um, glasses um, update or, or fill, give them some glasses, vision problem, address their vision problem. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Parisi, any other thoughts or, or suggestions? What's your opinion? 
you know, uh, in looking at other medical conditions, if that's the question, then I have to agree with Dr. Nunn in terms of uh, the, the biggest gun is probably diabetes. So I, and I think he summed that up uh, really well. Um, in, in terms of important eye conditions that maybe aren't necessarily associated with other uh, eye conditions, glaucoma is a huge uh, cause of vision loss. And although we can't always tie it specifically to other disease entities, uh, there are some fa familial history links that, that can sometimes uh, get people in for eye checkups if that dad had it or mom had it or, or, or brother or sister had glaucoma, important to, to be checked. And unfortunately, there are very few symptoms of glaucoma until it's far too late. And, and we all see those people come into the office um, and we just kind of shake our heads and wonder why weren't you getting an eye exam? And not that we're blaming them, but it's just the, the nature of the beast that uh, if people aren't symptomatic, they're not going to go and get eye exams. So probably education wise, alerting people that there are these conditions out there that they should be screened for. Uh, glaucoma, if you're over 40, or if you're African American, or you have other risk factors, important to get to get uh, uh, a screening exam. Yeah, we'll that out. Absolutely. Um, another thing that uh, has really um, been a focus for us is, you know, we've all been dealing with the coronavirus, and um, we've seen firsthand with that what it looks like for our healthcare system to become strained uh, for resources. Uh, while it certainly would not be on that scale, uh, what would the impact on our healthcare system look like if um, the projections that we looked at um, hold true, if there's not effective intervention and in, um, diabetic retinopathy, cataracts, glaucoma, um, and age-related macular degeneration um, increase significantly as they are expected to? Um, how will these other areas of medicine be affected and um, to what extent will that um, impose a, a burden on an already burdened um, broader healthcare system? Dr. Peterson, would you like to start this one? Not to be too much of a um, broken record, but children are the key. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> um, just that children with amblyopia or poor vision, you know, if they just have one good eye, then they are going to grow into, um, as you're talking about, you know, AMD and diabetic retinopathy um, and glaucoma increasing. Those children who grow up into adults who have those conditions are twice as likely to be significantly visually impaired. So it's really, if you can give children their best vision, um, it's a long-term gift to not just them, but society too, because they have a better chance of being able to um, keep on and getting caught in time. Um, oh. So that, that's, um, we, I think that was just one point I wanted to make. Um, you mentioned COVID. Um, and, and our strained medical resources. I think we have at MUSC started a telemedicine program where we have cameras. We've got six cameras out in primary care uh, clinics and they take fundus photos of diabetic patients looking for screening for diabetic retinopathy. And I think that's a great model for um, outreach, extending outreach into some of the rural communities and um, uh, and being efficient, then the, 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 the patients don't have to um, drive downtown to see or, or go to the retina doctor unless they're, they're at risk for um, significant problems from, from diabetic retinopathy. And they've done about 2,000 patients um, with that program, and I think that's a good model. And I think COVID has increased the telemedicine usage and will um, hopefully we can use some of those um, lessons moving forward to make healthcare more efficient. So. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Nunn, do you have any thoughts on that question? I do. Um, I think as prevalence of these diseases increase, 
um, we're going to find ourselves reliant on other medical professionals. Um, for example, oh, for other areas of medicine, nurse practitioners um, and physician's assistants are assuming some of that workload for ophthalmology. It's traditionally optometrists that assume a lot of that. So I think we're going to see a lot more routine healthcare being provided by optometrists. And then when there's a significant problem or surgery is required, then sending them over to the ophthalmologist. And for a lot of problems that have traditionally been dealt with by subspecialists, such as wet macular degeneration or diabetic retinopathy, um, comprehensive ophthalmologists may pick up a little burden on treating that once, say, a retina specialist starts becoming overwhelmed. Um, so I think it's going to be kind of redistributing responsibilities to folks who haven't traditionally participated in the care, but are still qualified to do so. Sure, that's a really good point. Um, Dr. Parisi, what are your thoughts on this? Sure. Um, you know, we, we had a little taste of this early on in the pandemic when much of the clinics were shut down for various reasons, uh, either mandatory or voluntarily uh, early on. And, um, and we, we struggled because we knew there were people that we needed to see uh, in order to be able to deliver the proper care in a timely fashion. There were people with AMD that needed their intravitreal injections. There were people with glaucoma who needed you know, pressures checked and, and medications adjusted. Um, our pediatric ophthalmologist, you know, struggled with getting children in for timely amblyopia treatment uh, because some of those can't wait. Uh, and um, so we, we understand what a strain on the resources can mean now. And as you say, with the aging baby boomer population uh, expanding uh, the elderly group, we're going to see an increase in all of these conditions. But sadly, the uh, ophthalmology training programs have not kept pace with graduating enough ophthalmologists to be able to take care of all these people. And so to Dr. Nunn's point, unless we do that, and even if we do do that, we're going to have to rely on other uh, uh, medical, paramedical and medical personnel to help with some of those, at least, at least the primary care aspect of it. Um, maybe not all of the surgical uh, um, treatments, but, uh, uh, and then using technology as Dr. Peter Stein talked about to, be, to make our decreasing numbers of care providers more efficient and able to get to more people. Um, whether that's automated fundus photography, amblyopia detection, um, at home pressure monitoring, uh, at home um, AMD vision monitoring, there are some, uh, really neat devices that patients can use at home to monitor their central vision and that report directly back to their ophthalmologist or eye care provider if there's a change in, in their macular status. Uh, the 4C home uh, uh, system is one of those. So I think we're going to need to use all of these techniques uh, and, and personnel to help us keep pace with the increase in demand. Yeah, absolutely. Um... I want to transition now to some of the, the questions that were submitted by um, the, the audience that's registered and um, many of who are, are with us today. Um, there are some really good questions here and, and one um, that particularly caught my eye, uh, I think is a great segue from this, uh, the conversation about the increasing um, burdens that we're seeing on vision health and on the healthcare system in general. Um, one of our nonprofit partners actually um, jumped right to, to the application of that. Um, if you had more resources for individuals with an impairment, what would they be? And how can we all help to um, ensure that all services are covered in our state um, to really get into um, some more of the, the problem solving, I, I guess, of, of this. Um, I, I love that question and would love to hear your thoughts as um, frontline practitioners in the field. Um, what would those resources be? Um, Dr. Nunn, would you like to start this one? Dr. Nunn, would you like to start our answers here? Yep. I apologize, my connection skipped out for a minute. 
Um, I honestly missed the end of the question. <laughs> sure, yeah. So if, if you had more resources for individuals with an impairment, um, what would they be? And how can we all help more to ensure that all services are covered in our state? Um, I think the biggest thing that I would want for is increased screening, finding those folks with an impairment earlier on, um, because every medical problem is easier to address the earlier you find it. The more advanced something gets, the less and less we can help. Um, glaucoma is something that we've talked about a number of times. Um, unfortunately, so often, when it, by the time folks realize they have symptoms and get to us, the horse is already out of the barn. It's too late to save anything. But if we can find these folks early on, we can treat them, we can save all that vision. Um, same thing with macular degeneration. Um, same thing with cataracts. You catch those early, piece of, take to cake, piece of cake to take care of. If you get a really advanced cataract that is, you know, patient's basically blind, you can still take care of it, but it becomes much more difficult. So I, I'd really want to focus on the screening there. Sure. Dr. Petersheim, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I'm all for screening, um, absolutely. Uh, I guess I'd take the opportunity, since you're talking about people with visual impairment for the children in our state, the South Carolina School for the Deaf and Blind and their outreaches are just you know, wonderful resources. Um, they partner with schools uh, to send out technology experts and visually impaired teachers they partner with BabyNet to um, send uh, visual impaired teachers and evaluators to the, to the home. Um, we just need, we need more of that. Uh, they're great. Uh, we at StormEye, we've got a low vision, um, you know, program and there's not a lot of emphasis, I think, or support for low vision care, but that, that would be expanded and would be really uh, beneficial to these people. Uh, and of course, you know, the Lions Club and Association of Blind and Visually Impaired are, are wonderful resources and, and do great work in the state too. So these people just do a wonderful job and we need to support them and expand their programs. Thank you. Um, for the record, we, we did not ask Dr. Peter Syme to, to plug our, our nonprofit partners, uh, including LVS, um, but I personally uh, agree with you on that. Uh, Dr. Parisi, what are your thoughts here? Sure, um, I agree with all that's, all that's been said. I'm all for screening. Uh, I think also uh, on the insurance level, it's increasing our, uh, our expanding our, our basic Medicaid insurance and, and other insurances that can cover uh, these basic screenings and, and early detection uh, uh, parameters that we've been talking about is, is critical. And um, increasing the uh, to piggyback on one, something I said earlier uh, regarding training, we need to train more, more docs uh, to, to fill the void that's gonna be left as doctors retire and the population increases. Uh, and so to whatever extent lobbying uh, for uh, our state to increase Medicaid rules and, and help with expanded coverage and, and uh, getting more kids seen, that along with the nonprofits that are assisting in that vein, uh, I think are all important. Wonderful. Those are all um, great things that we as nonprofits can continue championing, continue advocating for and, and working towards more sustainable um, and comprehensive access to solutions there. Um, another question that we had from uh, an audience member, um, we've touched a little bit on parts of this question, so um, I'll put it out there and just open it up for, for general comments if there are any other thoughts. But um, the question is, why do most children receive better and earlier dental care than vision care? Why are most children taken to an eye doctor after symptoms occur? Um. I guess I'll start on that one. I, I don't I don't know, and I don't I don't know that that's true. I guess I guess maybe it is true, and I'm that's that's sad. Um, we we certainly rely on screening with children. They they don't know what they're missing. They don't typically complain of problems, um, and um, some children do get missed. And and I guess increasing screening both with the pediatricians and with the community will help with that. Um, 
having, I was thinking about having said that, I think about a quarter of the patients that we see at Stormline in pediatric ophthalmology are referred from a vision screening. Um, usually the pediatrician, often the school, and our Head Start is, is good at picking up um, children's vision problems as well. So I don't, uh, you know, we are getting some of them. Um, and um, uh, so I want to applaud those efforts that are already out there. Um, Hopefully, hopefully it's changing and we're catching children earlier with the preschool at the preschool age, again, particularly with the, um, the acceptance of the photo screening type devices that are out there. Um, we can catch them sooner. So thank you. Sure. Dr. Parisi, do you have any additional thoughts on that? No, I think she, uh, Dr. Pearson summed that up very well. Yeah, I think kids get missed because they often still have one good eye and they don't complain. <laughs> So, yeah. Sure. Dr. Nunn, any other thoughts? Um, I don't know what the recommendations are for pediatric dentists. Um, I have a little guy at home. My wife came home one day and said, okay, we get, we got to get him to go see the pediatric dentist. And I said, why? And she said, because the pediatrician said so. And I said, okay. Um, but, you know, the pediatrician never suggested that he get any sort of ophthalmology care given, you know, I'm paying attention to him at home and he's getting the screening test that the pediatrician is doing. So maybe just general practice, um, only send folks to an ophthalmologist if they have a problem, send them to the dentist, even if they don't. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, to some of the earlier conversation, I, I wonder if, if more work with pediatricians um, to promote that focus on pediatric ophthalmology uh, might factor in or might, might be an effective solution there. Yep. Mm -hmm. There were um, a couple of questions uh, sent in about specific uh, medical uh, conditions and specific medical situations. Um, I, I won't get into all of those here, but um, there was one about um, something that we see uh, at Lions Vision Services a bit. And so, um, I will pose this to the group and let anybody um, chime in here. Uh, can CMV retinitis be cured? And if it's in remission, how often does a patient need to be tested? Dr. Nunn, would you like to start uh, that? Sure. Um, so CMV retinitis is a pretty uncommon condition. Um, it's something that I haven't really dealt with since my training, um, but in general, CMV retinitis only occurs in folks that are severely immunosuppressed, um, typically in folks with very bad AIDS. Um, the way to cure it is to improve the immune function, typically by getting the patient's CD4 count up to a more normal level. Um, I believe the recommendations for somebody who doesn't actively have CMV retinitis is to be screened about every three months. Mm -hmm. um, their CD4 count is low, but someone with a normal CD4 count, I don't think needs any additional screening for CMV retinitis specifically. Um, feel free to correct me if I've misrepresented any of that. Sure. Um, Dr. Parisi and then Dr. Petersheim, do you have any additional uh, thoughts or, or insight there? You know, not, uh, not really. I think uh, Dr. Nunn uh, summed it up. It is very rare. I, I may have only seen uh, one or two since residency. And uh, um, I recall back in the days of residency, even treating them with intra intravitreal gancyclovir, you know, these, these antivirals. Uh, uh, injecting, um, and, 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 and these were AIDS patients uh, back then as well, but uh, I'm sure there are uh, more and better antivirals that are used systemically as well uh, in today's treatment, uh, but I would uh, concur with, with the recommendations that Dr. Nunn set forth as, as far as I know. Dr. Petersheim, any additional? I'm going to agree. I'm going to agree and defer with the, the experts there. Wonderful. Um, 
we are coming up on uh, time here. We've got about five minutes left and um, uh, there are still a, a number of, of public questions that we didn't get the chance to get to. Um, I will circulate those um, amongst our panelists. And if anyone has any thoughts that they'd like to add, we can send some follow-up um, material out um, after the, the program to those that participated. Um, I, I'm pulling the chat box up now and seeing there's been some lively conversation going on here, which um, I appreciate. And um, I, I won't get into the, the Clemson football conversation that's that started there. But um, thank you all so much again for participating and for being a part of uh, this discussion. Um, just to wrap things up, um, Dr. Petersheim, we can start with you and, and then Dr. Parisi and Dr. Nunn. Any parting thoughts or parting words uh, on vision health in South Carolina and what we can be doing to better address that in our communities? Um, well, thanks so much for um, getting this together and um, letting us talk and share. I, I guess you, someone we mentioned earlier education, and I think the Lions Club works well on that too, and, and that's real important for um, everybody. So. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, yes, thanks uh, so much for the invitation to do that, uh, to do this with you all. Uh, it was great to uh, share uh, uh, the platform with Dr. Peter Simon Nunn. Uh, appreciate your expertise and what you do in, the, in South Carolina as well for, for our citizens. And yeah, I would just echo the main point I think that we, we came to this, this hour was the, the, the need for early detection, early screening and preventative care in, in being able to really decrease the burden of uh, eye related uh, problems and, and also their impact on general health care. Yep. Thank you again for having us. Um, it's been a good time. I think the main takeaway is prevention. Education and prevention are the key. Absolutely. Uh, well, thank you all again, Dr. Peterson, Dr. Parisi, Dr. Nunn, uh, and all of our partners at um, the Storm Eye Institute, at Clemson Eye, and at the Columbia Eye Clinic. Um, thank you for lending your uh, expertise and your time to us today. Um, thank you again to the Francis P. Bennell Foundation for providing um, technical support to make this presentation possible uh, and to all of our um, nonprofit and service partners that um, are on the call or might be listening to this later. Um, thank you for working in the trenches with us uh, to make vision health um, a priority for South Carolina um, and for partnering with us in that work of empowering those who are blind and visually impaired um, to live safe, meaningful and fulfilling lives. So. With that, we will close out the conversation today and um, thank you all again for your time. Stay safe and well. Thank you very much, you as well. Thanks a lot.